Hello. Just to uh, hello, just to put your um, your minds at ease, we are only actually starting at 7 p.m. So don't worry, you haven't missed it. It's uh, it's still going to start. So just hang on for another 10 minutes. I'm just seeing who else will arrive. Thank you.
Okay. Welcome, everyone. We'll, uh, yeah, yeah, I know. We'll just get going now. <laughs> it looks like um, those that were planning to come are now here. So, um, welcome all. Thank you for coming out. We, uh, we appreciate that you're um, willing to offer up your Friday evening. But we believe that this is an um, important topic and important material that will um, be our building for our faith. And we hope that you will be blessed by it. And we are very grateful for Creation Ministries coming out tonight. So, I'll just, uh, I'll start off by, I'll start off by uh, reading for us from Psalm 19. To the choir master, a Psalm of David. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and dripping of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Now I open it for us in prayer. Our gracious God and heavenly Father, we thank you for another wonderful day that you've blessed us with lord we thank you for the rain that you've sent us over the last few days and that you bless us with this lord as well and we ask well, we thank you that you that we can rely on you to look after your creation every single day just as you have over the centuries and we we thank you that we can trust in you for this and for our daily uh, uh, for everything we need daily as well we thank you that we can be here together this evening, Lord, and that, that we can be um, here to learn more about your creation. We ask that you would soften our hearts, Lord, and open our ears that we would be able to uh, hear as you speak, even through your creation. We ask that you would keep us uh, sin and distraction far away from us and that we would enjoy this time together. Bless uh, Mark as well in uh, his talk, that he would be um, clear in speaking and that we would also be able to understand. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. I'll uh, call Mark up and he will introduce himself. Thanks, Mark. Well, good evening, everyone. It's uh, a wonderful privilege to be able to be here today. My name is Mark Harwood and uh, I represent Creation Ministries International. And uh, our ministry is committed to encouraging Christians in particular to have confidence in the Word of God right from the very beginning. This is such a vitally important subject these days. A little while ago, a lady came up to me after a, a church service and she said, you know, I came today for the last time. I was, um, I was giving up on Christianity. There were so many questions I did not have answers to. I heard that there was a special speaker coming and so I thought, okay, Lord, this is it, last time and then that's it. And she said, today you've answered so many of the questions that I had. And she went away with uh, an uplifted heart and a beaming smile and uh, went away equipped with materials to, to study further and to learn. You know, it's such a vital issue. And I should declare right at the outset that I happen to believe that this book, the Bible, is God's word. 
and us as such be true from cover to cover. Is anyone with me on that tonight? Yep, that's good, fantastic, thank you. <laughs> well, I want to share tonight on this uh, subject of uh, going where the leads leads. And uh, often people will say to me, Mark, it's okay for you to have this belief in Christian things, but I go where the evidence leads. And what I mean is I follow the science because science is how we discover truth. You believe things that, you know, are unprovable and um, are just, I don't know, the writings of a bunch of ancient old Jews in a book that you revere. But I go where the evidence leads. But, you know, I think that the reverse is actually the case. That's what I want to share with you this evening. Because people who reject the Bible as God's word find themselves having to believe the most extraordinary thing. And look at the world around me, I discover that in fact the evidence is overwhelmingly in support of what God's word says. So how can such disparate views come about? Well, they come about because we all have what's called a world view. It's a set of beliefs that comes to us, whether we read things, hear things, see things or whatever. And, uh, and we all have a world view. Now, a world view is not something that is usually taught. In fact, it's actually sort of caught in the culture, in our families and so on. So in our culture, we're taught right from the very beginning that the universe made itself over vast periods of time, billions and billions of years, through unguided random processes. So when we look at the world, we see this evolutionary story, billions of years, random processes, death has always been present since the beginning. Uh, molecules transformed themselves into people, dinosaurs into birds and so on. So what I want to do this evening is invite you to change the glasses that you use to view the world, to taking God's word as the authority and basing your beliefs on what this word says and judging by the show of hands earlier on, most of you do that. Now when you do that, a different world view. Now you look at a creation that's only a matter of thousands of years old, not billions at all, no death before the fall of man, that created organisms reproduce after their kinds, dinosaurs lived with humans, Noah's flood was a global catastrophic event and so on. So many people think that the evolution story is based on science but I want to submit to you tonight that evolution is actually a belief system and it's a religion. Now Evolutionists who are honest and think about this recognise this and I want to share this quotation from Professor Michael Roos who said evolution is promoted by its practitioners as more than mere science. Evolution is promulgated as a, an ideology, a secular religion, a full-fledged alternate to Christianity with meaning and morality. Evolution is a religion. This was true of evolution in the beginning and it is true of evolution still today. So the conflict that we have in our society can be thought of like this. Some of you may have seen this uh, Russell's dog. And I think it's very left-hand side. We have the uh, secular humanist castle, which is the culture in which we It rests upon an evolutionary foundation where man decides what is true. And that, of course, is because there is no God in this worldview. So all there is is man and uh, what he believes. And emerging out of this castle come all the issues that we confront in our society today. Now on the right hand side we have Christian castle uh, based on the presumption of God's existence, that God's word is the truth and of course it begins by talking about the creation. Now it's sort of interesting when you look at what the different Christians are doing. You'll see this guy over here on the right hand side is actually firing shots at the foundations of his own castle, trying to destroy them. Um, sadly, many Christians uh, reject the opening chapters of Genesis as history. And uh, some are addressing the social issues of the day very rightly. 
You'll notice the one in the middle is actually lining up to take a pot shot at a fellow Christian. Um, on the right at the top, you'll see that guy's just firing randomly off into space at nothing in particular. And on the top, we have someone there who's completely unaware that there's even a battle going on. Now, I'm sure if you think about it, you might be able to uh, identify um, those aspects um, happening in the church today. That's the problem. And the church has, over the last several decades, or probably a couple of centuries actually, been largely ineffective in combating this secular humanistic worldview based on belief in evolution. So the solution, I believe, is that the church needs to start rebuilding its foundations, coming back to the word of God as the truth, in particular the opening chapters of the book of Genesis, which lay the foundation for all the rest of the biblical account and the gospel message. We, of course, need to continue to address the social issues, but we also need to be of secular humanism, this belief in evolution by pointing out that the evolutionary story is actually without supporting evidence. And that might uh, sound a pretty out there kind of statement, and I guess it is in this day and age, but I support that uh, as the talk proceeds. And of course we uh, shouldn't be firing shots at each other, should we? You know, the Bible says that we are to always be prepared we go, sorry. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. So when we encounter this culture of ours, which of course we all do because we live in it, we need to firstly be able to answer our own questions, we have the confidence to stand on the word of God and that what we believe is defensible. And also to be able to answer the questions of others who might ask questions of us. When I was a young man, yeah, I became a Christian when I was just 10 years old. But I grew up believing that perhaps God used evolution to create because that seemed to be a satisfactory compromise. I could pursue my interest in science as well as develop a, a view. But I was a very confused young Christian. I couldn't answer the question, why did Jesus die for me? You know, that's a pretty basic question, isn't it? And why couldn't Jesus have come to this earth, just lived a good life, shown us how to relate to our Heavenly Father, and then have been transfigured up into heaven? Why the cross? And I went to the leadership in my church and asked that question, and sadly, they couldn't answer me because they too believed that God used evolution to create. You see, the problem is that um, I have a problem with a microphone. <laughs> We're going to do a microphone swap. So here we go, let's do a test. All right, can you hear me? Ah, good. All right, where was I? I know. Why did Jesus die? You see, I couldn't understand it. And uh, because I grew up in a denomination which did not really have a high view of Scripture, they didn't really have a, an explanation for me either. But, you know, it wasn't until after I had finished my postgraduate work that the Lord really confronted me over this whole issue of origins. And I discovered two key things. Firstly, that I could believe that uh, Genesis was actual history, and I could believe it because the evidence everywhere we look is consistent with what we would expect if the historical record in Genesis was actually true. 
And the second thing I discovered was that I should believe it because it forms the basis of the very gospel message itself. And friends, it made so much sense of the world in which I was living. So when I was growing up, I couldn't do this. I was not prepared to give an answer. Couldn't answer my own questions, let alone the questions of other people. But then I came across some of the resources that I'm going to share with you later on from Creation Ministries. And in particular, we have uh, Creation Magazine, which is uh, what we might call our flagship publication. And uh, this is a magazine that uh, is, uh, we received so many testimonies from people whose lives have been impacted by it. And a lot of the illustrations that I'm going to use tonight come from previous issues of Creation Magazine. We also have a website, and this is deciding to go very slow. Hopefully, there we go. And this is what the front page of the website looks like. Uh, up in the top right-hand corner there, you'll see there's a search window which gives you access to thousands of different articles and items of interest, all aimed at encouraging you in your faith. There's a new article there on the front page every day, and we encourage people to go in there and read it and, uh, and to be strengthened in their confidence in the Word of God. Now, one of the good things about our website is that it has a very easy web address to remember. Now, friends, it turns out that if you say something at the same time as seeing it, it helps to imprint it into your memory. So I want you to say the web address with me when it comes up onto the screen. All right, is everybody ready for that? Yep, okay, so if you want to know anything about creation, you just go to, press this button twice, here it comes. What is it? Creation. Very good, couldn't be easier, could it? Now, I had the great privilege of working in the aerospace industry and I was involved in the design of all of Australia's national satellites. And I'm sure you've seen those little grey dishes on rooftops pointing up at the sky, you know the things I mean? Yep. Um, receiving things like uh, Foxtel, Ostar, um, all the pay TV channels and so on. Now, you do need to understand that I have nothing to do with the content that comes over the satellites, all right? Just hope you grasp that. But I did have a lot to do with the design of the spacecraft themselves. So the kind of science I was involved in is uh, what you might call experimental science. And that's the kind of science which gives us all the amazing technological gadgets that we just take for granted these days, like communication satellites, for instance, and mobile phones and computers and all the rest of it. But the important thing about experimental science is that it's based on observable, repeatable experiments. So a scientist in one country can conduct an experiment. Someone in another country can reproduce that experiment, repeat the results. And that's how our understanding of how the universe works, develops and progresses. And then we take those uh, discoveries, those principles that we learn and apply them to the development of novel technology. But it's based on observable, repeatable experiments. But there's another kind of science that we hear much about. It's what you could call historical science. And in historical science, the scientist looks at evidence in the present and uh, he makes up a story about the past to explain what he's observing in the present. So this guy looks at this chunk of rock and he discovers it's got a little fossil in it. Now, when a scientist makes up a story about the past to explain the present, something interesting happens, and if you think about it, this is inevitable. He engages his beliefs about the past. So when he looks at that little fossil, assuming he believes the evolutionary story, which most scientists do because that's the culture that we've been brought up in, I can imagine him thinking to himself, I wonder when that little creature uh, existed and, and where does it fit in that long, slow progression from the first primordial cell all the way up to complex organisms like you and me? And I can imagine him wondering, how many millions of years ago did it live? So can you see that what he already believes about its origins affects how he interprets the evidence? Does that make sense? Yeah? But if this guy was a Bible-believing uh, scientist, he might look at that fossil in the rock and think to himself, you know, that fossil was probably laid down 
as a result of Noah's flood, which probably deposited pretty much the whole of the fossil record all around the world today. <laughs> now, friends, that is a radically different interpretation of exactly the same piece of evidence. So we don't really sort of argue about the, the evidence. It's how we interpret the evidence. So let me just summarise that. Here we have experimental science, and it's based on the present and observable, repeatable experiments. Friends, do you know that there is never a disagreement between science and the scriptures in the area of experimental science? Never. The confrontation occurs in historical science, which is all about the unobservable, unrepeatable past. And if you think about it, it's no wonder that that's where the conflict lies. Think about those world views again. One begins with the assumption that there's no God and we have to explain everything in natural terms. That's the secular humanist castle. And the other begins by assuming that there is a God and that we explain the universe in those terms, drawing upon the historical record in the book of Genesis. No wonder there's a conflict in the area of historical science. So we could summarise that by saying science studies the repeatable, but history studies the unrepeatable. Now let me give you an example of this. <clears throat> Let's imagine that um, you've come around the corner of your house into the backyard and uh, there underneath a dripping tap, a bucket that's partly filled with water. Now because you're scientifically inclined, you can't help yourself, you measure the volume of water in the bucket and the rate at which the tap is dripping, as you do, and you ask yourself that all-important question, how long has the bucket been under the tap? So, this is time for uh, mathematics. There'll be a short examination, by the way, at the end of this session, so I hope you're listening. <laughs> Six litres of water in the bucket, and it's been dripping at the rate of half a litre every hour. How long has that bucket been under the tap? Anybody? Who wants to have a go? Yeah? Twelve hours. Good mathematician. Who thinks it's been there for 12 hours? Yep, most of you. All right. Now, that could well be right. But remember, we have just chanced upon the scene. You weren't there when the bucket was put under the tap. So to get 12 hours, the young lady there had to make some assumptions. What assumptions did we make to get 12 hours? Anyone? Sorry? that it's been dripping at the same rate. Now, we don't know that because we weren't there the whole time. We? we have just chanced upon the scene. Someone could have turned the tap on hard, partly filled the bucket, turned the tap off carelessly and left it dripping just seconds before you came around the corner. What else did we assume? Somebody? That the bucket was empty when it went under the tap. Exactly, you don't know that either. You see, it may have been partly filled, mightn't it? So... There's all sorts of assumptions that have to be made before we can calculate how long the bucket's been under the tap. But let's imagine that your backyard is a very important backyard and you have a resident historian. And the resident historian documents that the bucket was placed under the tap at five past one. You came around the corner at 1.50 and you now ask the question, how long has the bucket been under the tap? Who wants to have a go at that? Anyone? Now, you're not game now, are you? You think I'm trying to trick you. Yes, young man. 45 minutes. Okay, now I might say to you, now, I'm a scientist and you're just a historian, and we have amazing technology now that can measure the volume of water in buckets by counting the very molecules. We can measure the drip rate on taps to the nearest, I don't know, millilitre per century or something or other. And when we apply all that amazing technology, you know you're right, it's not 12 hours, it was actually 11.973621, down to the nearest microsecond. So, with all my fancy technology, am I actually any closer to the solution? Who thinks the scientist is going to get it right? Who thinks the historian gets it right? Who never puts their hand up if asked a question in... You know? <laughs> With all the fancy technology, friends, you still had the same set of assumptions to make because you were not there when the bucket went under the tap. Can you see that the historian wins every time?
time. The eyewitness account is what we need. And you know what? That's what we've got in this book, the Bible. It's God's eyewitness account of what he did right at the very beginning. So we can reach a few conclusions. Firstly, age cannot be measured. Ages are always calculated. Scientific ages are calculated and they depend upon the assumptions made. Do you know that you can get any age you like by changing the assumptions? And if you make a measurement and the age comes out wrong, i.e. not what you expected, then you can fiddle your assumptions to make sure it does come out as you expected it. But the worst thing is your assumptions about the past cannot be scientifically verified because we can't observe the past. Assumptions reflect our a priori beliefs. You see, no scientist approaches the evidence with neutrality. We all come with a world view. So age can only be determined by a reliable historical record. And folks, where do we get the reliable historical record? from God's word. It's the eyewitness account of what he did at the beginning. So let me ask you a question. We all believe something about our origins by faith because we weren't there, nobody was, and so we believe something but we do it by faith. So my question to you, is your faith supported by evidence? And I want to use two pictures this evening. One is of this young lady taking a tentative step into a pond or a lake and, you know, she can see the, the, the uh, ground underneath the water, but nonetheless it takes a bit of faith to take that step, doesn't it? But all the evidence is supporting her that she's not going to plunge into a huge hole. And then this young fellow, we would just hope that he's uh, checked that the water is deep enough and there are no rocks and all the rest. And I want to use this to represent a leap of faith believing something in spite of or even contrary to the evidence. So what does the Bible say about our beginnings? It begins by telling us that the Lord created everything in just six normal length days, just like the days we experience now. In the opening chapters of Genesis, it also gives us what are called the chronogenealogy, starting with Adam in the top left-hand corner there, um, all the way through Noah and around to Abraham. And that uh, you can just add the numbers up, which are all there in Genesis chapter 5, and you'll discover that Abraham was born about 2,000 years after the creation. From the time of Abraham, you can go through to King David and then via the line of Mary and the line of Joseph to the time of Jesus. And that is also about 2,000 years. From the time of Jesus to the present day is about 2,000 years. So here we are, according to the Bible, not my idea, about 6,000 years after the creation. 6,000 years. Wow, that uh, seems unbelievable, doesn't it? But you know Jesus believed Genesis was actual history. Some lawyers came and challenged Jesus about marriage. And he answered them and he said, but from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Well, that sounds right, doesn't it? And on the sixth day of creation, God made human beings. And that was about 4,000 years before when he was speaking. So day six is indeed the beginning. But if, in fact, God had used evolution to create, then there would have been billions of years and mankind appearing just at the end, which is hardly from the beginning. Now, the scientific community claims to be able to bolster the idea of the billions and billions of years through a number of uh, ways of, uh, of measuring processes. And one of them, of course, is uh, radioisotope dating or radiometric dating. And I want to touch briefly on this because we hear much about these, uh, these ages of rocks and fossils and so on. Now, radiometric dating is a bit like an hourglass. You have a, a parent element there at the top which decays at a certain rate um, and uh, forms what's called the daughter element. So if you can measure the ratio of parent element to daughter element in your sample, then you can calculate the age. But just cast your mind back to the bucket of water again. We have the same problems of needing to make assumptions. For instance, we don't know the uh, quantity of parent element at the beginning or whether some's been added or subtracted. Same with the daughter element. And uh, we don't actually know whether or not the decay rate has been constant. 
there are really seven different conceptual assumptions which have to be made. But what we can do is take some rocks with a known age and test the dating methods against them. So how do you get a rock of known age? Well, a really good way is to take some rock from the lava dome of a volcano which has a known eruption date. Now, there's a measuring uh, system called potassium argon. Argon is an inert gas. It bubbles out of molten lava. But it gets trapped when the lava solidifies. And so the clock should start ticking. So here are some examples at Mount St. Helens, uh, erupted in 1980. Rocks sampled from that lava dome gave ages from 350,000 to 2.8 million years. Here's another one from uh, Hawaii, this time Kilauea. Uh, it's actually been in the news a bit over the last couple of years because it's still erupting. But this particular eruption took place about 200 years ago, but rocks from the lava from that eruption were dated anywhere from zero to 22 million years old. And uh, here, Hawaii in Hawaii, also about 200 years ago, rocks anywhere between 160 million and 3.3 billion years old. So, friends, here's the problem. When you date rocks that have a known age, we get the wrong results. So how can we have confidence that when we date rocks with an unknown age, that the results are coming back correct. Interestingly, in the, the papers, uh, scientists often say things like, dating young rocks is notoriously difficult. But if you think about that statement, all you do is you find a rock, you don't know it's young or old. You give it to the dating laboratory to tell you its age. And so how do you know if it's young or old? Um, but if it's young, apparently it's notoriously difficult to date. What does that say? about the integrity of the dating. I like this quotation. It says, in conventional interpretation of potassium argon age data, it's common to discard ages which are substantially too high or too low compared with the rest of the group or with other available data, such as the geologic time scale. Now, friends, let me just pause there. Think back on that world view image. Remember, you look at the world and you interpret it through your beliefs. So if you believe in the vast ages and evolution and you get a date which doesn't fit, then this is uh, what you do. The discrepancies between the rejected and the accepted data are arbitrarily attributed to excess or loss of argon. So in other words, they make an assumption to fix the result because it doesn't work. But, you know, different dating methods should give about the same age for things which must be about the same age. This is an example from Crina Mine in Queensland. About 21 metres down, a layer of basalt was discovered. That's uh, solidified lava. It was dated at 45 million years old, but the lava had flowed through a forest. And there were still um, elements there of uh, or samples of charred wood from the trees. And the wood was carbon dated from 44 to 45,000 years old. And that's a factor of a thousand difference in things which must be about the same age. And this quote I like, it says, if a carbon-14 date supports our theories, we put it in the main text. If it does not entirely contradict them, we put it in a footnote. And if it's completely out of date, we just drop it. Now, I'm not trying to make fun of scientists here because I am one, but what this shows you is how our belief systems work. So you get data which doesn't fit what you expect the result to be, so what do you do with it? I mean, these tests are expensive and you normally have a research grant, you can't send them all back to do it again. So what do you do? Well, the ones which don't fit you, you reject. You put them in a footnote perhaps or, or you just ignore the results that don't work. But, you know, carbon-14 is actually a friend of biblical creationists. Let me share this with you. Ladies, some of you here this evening may have a diamond. It's called the girl's best friend, isn't it? Now, diamonds are believed to be between 1 and 3 billion years old. It's the hardest naturally occurring form of carbon, and uh, you cannot get impurities into or out of diamond. So, being so old, it couldn't possibly have carbon-14, which only survives for maybe 60 to 80,000 years at most. So, nobody had bothered to go through the expensive process of measuring for the presence of carbon-14 in diamond until 
a group of scientists did so. And it turned out that in each sample there were significant quantities of carbon-14, indicating that the diamonds could not be billions of years old, but only thousands. Now, I mentioned the Creation magazine earlier on. We had an article in it. We called it Diamonds, a Creationist's Best Friend. In fact, carbon-14 turns up regularly in coal, which is supposedly tens to hundreds of million years, uh, years old. Once again, routinely carbon-14 is found, indicating an age of only thousands of years. So, friends, what I'm showing you here is that the evidence, the observable evidence, is not consistent with the evolutionary story in these particular instances, and there are many others. Let me share another one with you. Our atmosphere consists of a number of different gases, one of which is helium. That's the gas that people put in party balloons, and, you know, you get a mouthful of it and it makes your voice sound funny. I bet the young people have done that. Have you guys done that? Got a mouthful of helium? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I notice all the older people put their hand up. Then that's interesting. <laughs> you know, helium is constantly being added to the Earth's atmosphere through radioactive decay processes in the Earth's crust. Some of it actually manages to uh, escape, and uh, in a minute you'll see our SKP will disappear. That took me hours to do that. I hope you appreciated that. You know, knowing the rate at which that helium is accumulating and how much is actually there, we can put an upper limit on the age of the atmosphere. And all that helium would have got there in less than two million years. Now, friends, that's a disaster for the evolutionary story because, hey, that's not long enough for evolution to have taken place, is it? But it's not just processes on Earth. When we look around our solar system, back in 2015, the New Horizons spacecraft flew past Pluto and took the most amazing photographs. Now, surrounding Pluto are a bunch of small moons. And typically, small moons end up what's called tidally locked to the planet that they orbit. That means one face always points towards the planet. A bit like our moon orbiting the Earth. One face always points to the Earth. But that is not the case with Pluto's small moons. And courtesy of NASA, this little graphic shows you the orbiting moons of Pluto. Now, the two in the centre there, you can see are um, Pluto and its moon Charon. The little white dots show you that they are tidally locked. The faces are looking at each other as they rotate. But the first moon sticks, the red one, rotates every three and a bit days. And then you have Nix, the yellow one, but notice it's rotating backwards compared to the direction that the others are rotating, which is inexplicable in the standard model of planetary formation. Kerberos is green, it goes around every 5.3 days, but look at little Hydra screaming around there about every 10 or so hours. Now, friends, as a moon rotates in the presence of the gravitational field of a planet, is like a gravity break on it, which is slowing it down. It could not have been orbiting Pluto for billions of years. Otherwise, it would be tidally locked by now. When we look around our planet, we discover there are about 8 billion people on the planet. Do you know if you start with six people, Shem, Ham and Japheth, the three sons of Noah and their wives, and let that population grow at a conservative rate of just half a percent, after four and a half thousand years, do you know how many people you get? About 8 billion. You see, it's consistent with what we observe in the world around us. But, you know, if we'd been here for 100,000 years, as the evolutionary story would tell us, where are all the people? We should be shoulder to shoulder on every square metre of the Earth's surface, including the ocean basins, and then some. But it's not like that. I recommend this article if you want to dig more deeply into this issue of the age of the Earth. You'll find it on our website at creation.com forward slash age. So, friends, I think it's a huge leap of faith to believe that the Earth is billions of years old. And the reason I say that is that the evidence actually does not support that belief. Now, that's an amazing statement to make in this day and age, isn't it? Because everywhere you look, you're told about the vast antiquity of the Earth. But what a tiny little step of faith to believe that the Earth is only thousands and not billions of years old. Why? because the evidence supports it. Now, this is the planet on which I live. I had a, um, 
I presume you do too. I had a youth group a little while ago, and I must confess I did wonder where they were from. But anyway, <laughs> it was in the, the discipline of geology that the idea of the vast antiquity of the earth first arose. And uh, it happened in the late 1700s. And the, the way it happened was this. People would look at um, geological structures like the Grand Canyon with all its layers and layers of rock. And uh, the story is that each layer is laid down by some kind of catastrophe or flood or whatever. And then sometimes later another flood occurs and then another and then another and slowly all these layers slowly build up. Must have taken millions and millions of years. And in the case of the Grand Canyon, along comes the Colorado River and it carves out this massive canyon. Well, I mean, you look at it, it must have taken millions of years, right? Well, let's take a closer look. And here are two of the layers. The top one there is called the Coconino Sandstone. Underneath it is the Hermit Formation. And there's a very sharply defined contact between those two layers. Now, that conventional geological story would have it that there is a 10 million year gap between the Hermit Formation and the Coconino Sandstone on top. Now, that means that that layer, that boundary, lay exposed for 10 million years. But wouldn't you expect to find some evidence of elapsed time? Like, surely there'd be evidence of vegetation, tree roots, animal burrows, and, the s and certainly the next time it rained, there would be evidence of erosion. I mean, after all, the whole of the Grand Canyon is supposed to be the result of erosion. But friends, there is no evidence of erosion in the hundreds of kilometres that that contact is exposed in Grand Canyon. So have we ever seen layer upon layer upon layer of rock form rapidly? Well, we have indeed. In May of 1980, Mount St. Helens erupted in Washington State and it changed the geology around the area, including the formation of Little Grand Canyon. Now, if you applied the conventional geological interpretation to that, you'd look at those layers and think, you know, layer after layer after layer, it must have taken many years to build all of that up. And then there's a little river at the bottom that must have slowly carved out, must, must represent millions of years, right? But friends, none of that material was even there before 1980. Now, how do we know that? Well, we observed it to happen. Remember what science was about. It's about observation, isn't it? Now, the canyon was formed about two years after the initial eruption. And there was a, a, a breach of a natural dam and a massive mud flow came through that area. And it carved out a canyon one fortieth the size of the real Grand Canyon. How long do you think it would take to carve a canyon one fortieth the size of the real Grand Canyon? Friends, it took just one day. One day. How do we know? We observed it to happen. And it's got all the signatures that are usually interpreted as meaning millions and millions of years. So is there some event in the past that would have had much volcanism and layering of sedimentary rocks on a global scale? Well, you guessed it, the global flood of Noah. And the Bible says all the springs of the great deep burst forth and the floodgates of the heavens were opened. This was a global watery disaster. And the Bible says the waters rose and increased greatly on the earth and, and all the high mountains under the entire heavens were covered. This was a global disaster on a scale that has never been seen since or before. Now, up the back there, you will have seen the books and materials we had. You may not have seen, but we have a scale model of the ark, 170th scale model. And you can see there animals and people, just to give you some impression of how big this vessel was. Many people say to me, though, ah, but it was just a local flood. You see these ancient Jews sitting around the campfire. They, some of them saw this flood in the Mesopotamian River Valley and they wrote about it in very uh, graphic terms. And uh, look, it became a global flood. But friends, how could you cover all the high mountains under the entire heavens with a global flood. Unless, of course, it was something like this. Which, of course, is bizarre. <laughs> and then people say, ah, but where did all the water go? 
you know, those gotcha type questions. Well, with the aid of Google Earth, you can zoom back from the planet. And if you do that over the Pacific Ocean, you can see a little bit of Australia there in the bottom left and the US west coast in the top right. There's a lot of water <laughs> out there. Do you know if you could raise the ocean basins and lower the continents so that the whole Earth was a perfectly smooth sphere like a billiard ball, the water of the oceans would cover the Earth to a depth of nearly 3,000 metres. There's a huge amount of water and that is where the water went. Not far from where I live in Sydney, there's this uh, cliff face at a beach and there you can see some sedimentary rock and mudstone at the bottom and then there's uh, a coal-bearing deposit. That whitish layer is volcanic ash. Then another coal-bearing sedimentary layer, more volcanic ash and so on. What this speaks of is a massive watery disaster punctuated by volcanic eruptions, a very violent event leaving that behind it. We find all around the world polystrate fossil trees, trunks that run through multiple levels of rock. If each of those layers took thousands of years to form, the tree would long since rot away. And what about folding in rocks like this amazing structure here in, uh, near Dublin? And what's happened here is that all of these sedimentary layers have been laid down rapidly and then with the buckling of the Earth's crust as the mountains rose and the valleys sank down at the subsidence of the flood, the crust has been pushed and buckled and these freshly deposited sediments have been folded dramatically like that. Now think about this a minute. Has anyone here ever tried to bend a rock? Doesn't work, does it? <laughs> it just shatters. But friends, there's no sign of shattering in those bends. So what it says is that the layers were still water laden and plastic when all that crustal movement took place. I want to play you a short video clip that comes from our DVD, Evolution's Achilles Heels. And in this you'll see some amazing examples of water laid mountain ranges. There are some things about modern mountain belt that we see I think it's a huge leap of faith to believe that gradual processes have shaped the major geological features of this planet. But what a tiny little step of faith to believe that the global flood best describes the major geological features. Now, I just want to touch quickly on uh, the fossil record. You know, when paleontologists dig up fossil bones and things, they actually don't have little tags on them telling them how old they are. Now, I know you obviously know that, but what the scientists have is the fossil, which they can e examine the physical and chemical properties thereof, and that's experimental science or operational science. But when they make pronouncements about the age, they're actually engaging in an interpretation based on their beliefs, and that, of course, is historical science. And that's where we get these kinds of charts, where we see the 
the fossil record and down the left hand side we have all the millions and millions of years and so on and uh, this presumed neat orderly arrangement of fossils. Now there is a broad structure and order to the fossil record but it's definitely not neat and orderly by any means. In fact uh, there are fossil graveyards with all kinds of fossils uh, of animals all bunched in together and it's an interesting question how do fossils form and uh, in our biology textbooks and sometimes on interpretive signs we might see something like this uh, and on this particular sign it says that this little fish was swimming happily along it died sank to the bottom of the river or lake in, that it was in some sediment was swept in slowly covered over the body and then it ultimately became a fossil but friends that's a story about the unobserved past right that's historical science but we can do some experimental science some observations now the next time you go snorkeling or scuba diving and you look down at the ocean floor will you see all those dead fish lying there waiting to become fossils no <laughs> it's not like that is it you see to form a fossil we need special conditions one of which is rapid burial and deep burial so that predators cannot get to the body to dig it up and eat it. When we look at the fossil record, we find some fascinating examples. Now, this is a creature called uh, an ichthyosaur. It's an extinct marine reptile. And it happens to be a female ichthyosaur. Can anybody tell how I know that that is a female ichthyosaur? Well, it's got cute eyelashes and... Nice whiskers, maybe? Can anybody tell? Yeah. yeah. Exactly. It's in the process of giving birth. Now, friends, ladies, I've heard of long labors, but not thousands of years, right? This happened rapidly. In the act of giving birth, this creature's been dumped on, buried, and is now in the fossil record. And this guy didn't even get time to finish eating his lunch. And here we have an amazing Congo line of trilobites. Um, all beautifully preserved in the fossil record. Now, if that happens slowly, they're not going to all be nicely lined up waiting their turn to become a fossil, right? So, fossilization requires those special conditions. So, how does a fish fossil form? Well, probably something like this. Little fish is swimming happily along, gets dumped on by tons of mud and sediment, ends up buried in the layers of rock, whereupon it dutifully becomes a fossil. Now, Charles Darwin recognized that fossilization would really only in his slow gradual model apply to creatures with skeletons and so he observed that no wholly soft organism can be preserved but what have we found we find fossilized jellyfish and many of them indeed not only that we find fossils of creatures that were thought to have become extinct or lived millions of years ago and are now living. They're called living fossils, like this sea urchin. On the left, we have the fossil. On the right, the modern form, liquid amber leaves. Uh, here we have a ginkgo tree leaf. On the left, a fossil believed to be 300 million years old, and the same thing growing today, completely unchanged. The famous example is the coelacanth, thought to have become extinct 300 million years ago, but uh, that was until one was uh, fished out of the Indian Ocean in 1938. And I love this one. It's a, a dragonfly wing fossilised, believed to be 200 million years old. And uh, here, for comparison, is a modern dragonfly wing. And if I take away the fossilised stone, what you see is exactly the modern wing. So where are all the intermediate fossils? Now, Darwin recognised in his theory that they needed to be, the theory needed to be supported by the evidence. And he said, why then is not every geological formation and every stratum full of such intermediate links? Geology assuredly does not reveal any such finely graduated organic chain, and this perhaps is the most obvious and serious objection that can be urged against the theory. Well, that was 100 and 60, 70 years ago, and he thought that as more and more of the fossil record was found, it would support his theory. This man, Dr. Colin Patterson, wrote a book about fossils, and someone wrote to him about the book. He wrote back and said this, 
I fully agree with your comments on the lack of direct illustration of evolutionary transitions in my book. If I knew of any fossil or living, I would certainly have included them. Now think about this. This is the senior paleontologist at the British Museum of Natural History. He went on, on and said, I will lay it on the line. There is not one such fossil for which one could make a watertight argument. That's a very serious admission, isn't it? Here in the Chicago Field Museum is uh, the presumed uh, structure of the evolution of dinosaurs. And uh, the numbers shown there are the number of fossil pieces of evidence that supports the existence of these creatures. And here is the fossil evidence that supports the branching. And in fact, as you can see, there's absolutely none at all. So all of those branches of the tree are pure imagination. A little bit more of a detailed example of that published in Science Journal, uh, the dinosaur evolutionary tree. And all of these links in there, which I've shown in red and blue, are called ghost linkages. But if you remove them, uh, they're ones, by the way, for which there is no evidence, no fossil evidence. If you remove the ghost linkages, you end up simply with fossils of discrete kinds of dinosaur. Nothing showing the assumed tree. And I'm sure you've all seen this uh, famous icon of human evolution. The progress from um, our common ancestor with the apes all the way up through to upright man, Homo sapiens. And this is a classic icon depicting evolution. Now my colleague Scott Devlin has prepared a short video clip which I'll play for you now which discusses the evidence for this iconic picture. You may recognise this image from school textbooks, t-shirts, soda apples, and everything in between. But what if I were to tell you that if we're to be honest with the evidence that we have, this picture should look more like this? Let me explain. On the left is what is believed to be the first ape, known as Procouncil, and on the right is a human called Homo sapiens. But what scientific evidence is there for everything else in this image? The transitional species. Let's find out. We'll start with Homo neanderthalensis. You might know him as Neanderthal man. Recent discoveries have shown that Neanderthal man made a war jewelry, played instruments, used tools, and wore makeup. We've even found his brain was the same or slightly larger than the average human living today. In other words, Neanderthal man was actually just a man. What about Homo erectus? Recent discoveries have shown that Homo erectus made tools, engaged in artwork, spoke intelligent language, and made and sailed boats. In other words, Homo erectus was also just a man. Now we'll come back to Homo habilis in a moment, but first, let me show you something. Have you ever heard of Lucy, the most famous so-called ape man, paraded in our museums, one of the very first Australopithecus afarensis species ever to be found? But what does the evidence reveal? She had a skull that was sloped and ape-like, nothing like human skulls, fingers that were curved, not at all like human fingers, toes that were curved, not at all like human toes, wrists that had the ability to lock for knuckle walking, and a knee structure that was compatible with life in trees. So Lucy and her kind swung from trees and looked like today's apes. Lucy is an extinct type of ape. As we've just seen, Homo really want to see some strong evidence for Homo habilis, the pivotal point of transition between stoop ape and upright man, between basic instinct and intelligent thought, between animal noise and intelligent speech. The only problem is, in the words of Ian Tassel, Homo habilis is a waste basket taxon, little more than a convenient recipient for a motley assortment of hominin fossils. Other scientists refer to him as a garbage bag because the bones we have for him are a mixture of human and ape bones. In other words, Homo habilis never existed. I think evolutionary professor Bernard Woods sums this up well. Our progress from ape to human looks so smooth, so tidy, it's such a beguiling image that even the experts are at low to let it go. But it is an illusion. 
with the lack of evidence and agreement on the eight human transition forms, why is this not happening? Or this? And is a better explanation that man and apes have always coexisted and reproduced according to their own kind, as stated in Genesis 1. So I think Scott does an excellent demolition job of that classic icon. Indeed, I would say that evolution is the substance of fossils hoped for, the evidence of links not seen, with apologies to the author of Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now, you may have heard the uh, claim that we are less than 2% different from the chimpanzees, which therefore proves that we have a common ancestor with them. But you know what? We also share 50% the same DNA as bananas. But that doesn't make us half a banana, does it? <laughs> you see, similarities are actually evidence of common design, not of common ancestry. But even if we did have just 2% difference, out of our 3 billion letters in our DNA, that represents 60 million base pairs. Now, scientists have analysed the time it would take through random processes to uh, make the sort of genetic changes necessary. And it turns out it would take 84 million years to get just two base pairs lined up together. And yet we're supposed to have separated from our common ancestor with chimps just 7 million years ago. Human evolution is in fact an impossible story. I want to play a quick clip here which is actually taken from a secular website that really debunks this whole 2% story. Now the secularists know that it is very misleading. In fact, I'd say it's a lie. But it still crops up, doesn't it? In documentaries, in books, and all kinds of things. Listen to this. When researchers sat down to compare the chimp and human genomes, the single letter differences were easy to tally. But the big mismatch sections weren't. For example, if a genetic paragraph, thousands of letters long, appears twice in a human scroll, but only once in its chimp counterpart, should that second human copy count as thousands of changes, or just one? And what about identical paragraphs that appear in both genomes, but in different places, or in reverse order, or broken up into pieces? Rather than monkey around with these difficult questions, the researchers simply excluded all the large mismatch sections, a whopping 1.3 billion letters in all and performed a letter-by-letter -letter comparison on the remaining 2.4 billion, which turned out to be 98.77% identical. So, yes, we share 99% of our DNA with chimps if we ignore 18% of their genome and 25% of ours. Wow, a bit disingenuous, isn't it? So you've got to ignore 18% of the chimp de uh, genome and 25% of ours to be able to make that extraordinary claim. So rather than looking at the fossil record like this, it actually makes a lot more sense to understand that it is the order of burial of things as a result of the flood. So you know, it's a huge leap of faith to believe that the fossil record shows evolution over eons of time because the evidence does not support that view. But what a tiny step of faith to believe the fossil record shows the order of burial by the flood. Now, I started by saying that we should always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. And I pointed you to uh, our website, which is an absolute goldmine of resource. So there it is, creation.com. But we offer a lot of other ways in which you can stay connected with the ministry and across these issues. One is a free email newsletter service. We call it Creation Info Bytes. And uh, this gives you a, an encouraging digest of the articles in the previous week or two. We don't spam your inbox, by the way. You only get one of these approximately one or two weeks. And uh, you can find out if things are happening in your area. And the very first email you receive will give you access to a free video download. So this is a wonderful way to stay connected with what's going on postcode there. Then if something's happening in your area, we can tell you about it. I mentioned the Creation magazine, which uh, is written for lay people. It's a top quality publication with a children's section in the middle. So it's great for the kids to have a look at and to read. The articles are all um, fairly short and to the point. They all give honour to our Creator God 
and help in building your faith. You can subscribe for one or three years and with every subscription today you will get a free back issue of the magazine so you've got something to read and then hopefully to give away to others. If you give us your email address then you can share each issue with up to five different devices. Now grandparents that's a wonderful way you can get this faith building material into your grandchildren's hands and boy do they ever need it today. We get wonderful testimonies. I love this one. This lady wrote and said, thank you for this much needed magazine. The information empowers Christians to share the gospel. And it does that because it gives us the confidence that we know we stand on the truth of God's word. And this guy was fantastic. Somebody gave him a copy of Creation magazine and he's now become a Christian and in the kingdom. But I love what he did next. Then I subscribed for five of my relatives, four of them have now come to the Lord. So out the back you'll find uh, a form like this, you need to fill that out so we know where to send it. And at the bottom of the form is a $15 voucher, if you take a three year subscription you can apply that $15 voucher to any of the resources that we have out on the tables today. Uh, including for instance the Creation Answers book which is this little red book consists of 20 short chapters that ask the most, que the most um, uh, asked questions that Christians and non-Christians alike have, like, does God exist? Uh, what about carbon dating? We touched on that this evening. And the classic question, who was Cain's wife? All there in the answers book. Another way of spending your $15 is on some of the DVDs we have out there. Um, this particular one is a talk by Dr. Martin Williams, we actually, I don't think, have this one out there, but we have a similar one called The Gospel Implications of Creation. I uh, highly recommend his material. Now, the Answers book has been packaged with uh, a DVD giving the big picture of creation and uh, this little blue booklet called Refuting Evolution. And that's priced so that it's like buying two of those things and getting the third one for free. If you want to really dig into this issue, I recommend the Genesis account. It's a theological, historical and scientific commentary in depth on the first 11 chapters. Evolution's Achilles Heels, that I played the uh, video clip out of, um, written by eight PhD scientists, I had this, nine actually, nine PhD scientists. I had the privilege of being one of the contributing authors to that book and it has a companion DVD and uh, I recommend that uh, to you. Uh, this is a book released only early this year Titans of the Earth, Sea and Air, all about dinosaurs. We didn't get time to talk about those this evening. And a wonderful resource for study groups, um, the Genesis Academy, it consists of 12 uh, approximately 30 minute teaching DVDs and uh, there's a free study guide available as well. From our website there's a whole media page with all kinds of streaming videos which are available for you. So let me just close off by summing up. You know, the Bible describes three conditions of the earth. The first one is that original, perfect, created world, which God declared to be very good. There was no suffering, no death, no disease, no pain. It was a beautiful, perfect creation. But into that creation came an intrusion, the intrusion of death, disease and suffering because of the sin of mankind. And friends, that is the world that we live in today. It's a broken world. It's not the world that God originally created. It's a mere fractured, if you like, version of it. But the Bible also says there is coming a new heaven and a new earth, which will be a restoration of the original, but in fact, even better. Now, if, like me, you have tried to integrate the millions and millions of years into your understanding of the Bible, it's, it's like taking that left-hand corner out of the picture. But can you see what that leaves us with? It means that God must have created the world in a mess, full of suffering and death. So how then can God be a good God? How often do the sceptics say, Christian, if God is good, why is there so much suffering? 
Friends, if we don't understand the opening chapters of Genesis as true history, we have no coherent way of answering that challenge. But you know, it's even worse than that because if the new heaven and new earth are a restoration, a restoration to what? Billions of years of more death, struggle and suffering? In other words, if the millions of years are true, folks, all we've got is this dying, decaying planet and no hope. That's why it's so important we put that opening section back into our understanding. And that gives the big picture. You see, it's because of Adam's sin that Jesus came. The first Adam brought suffering and death into the world. And in the greatest act of love that this universe has ever seen, God sent his own son who left his home in glory, came to this decaying planet, lived a perfect life and suffered a terrible death for each and every one of us. He bore our sin in his body and shed his blood for us so that we who place our faith in him can go free. What an amazing gospel message we have to share with this lost and dying world. But of course he rose from the dead, didn't he? Defeating death and proving that he is indeed the son of God. And today he's seated at the right hand of God the Father, interceding for each and every one of us. And the Bible says he's the soon coming king. He's that bridegroom seated at the wedding feast to which we have all been invited. But friends, none of that makes any sense unless we begin in Genesis. So thank you very much for your attention and let me hand back to Pastor Sean. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mark. That was really good and very insightful. I, I hope you all share my, uh, my thoughts on that. So um, what we're going to do now is we're going to have a 15-minute coffee break. You're welcome to go out, out the back there and enjoy a cup of coffee and some fellowship. And then the idea is in about um, 15 minutes, let's say at half past eight, we'll come back for some questions and answers. So you, if you have any questions that you've been sort of... Uh, wanting to ask for a while or just after after the presentation you're welcome to ask them so we'll send the mic around at, at that stage then just um, for those I should have said before but the toilets are around the back uh, in the left through those white doors there if you need to go there uh, now uh, afterwards and then just a reminder that um, the materials are all at the back there you're welcome to go and browse them now as well in the coffee break or afterwards um, they have cash and card facilities available and then we're also going to be uh, at the end of the Q&A session we'll just send around the collection bag if you want to give anything as a donation to, the, to their ministry you're more than welcome to do that uh, although you're not obligated to. All right, thank you very much. We'll be back at half past eight and then uh, we'll ask some questions. Thanks.
Thank you. Hello. There we go. Hello. All right. If you could all just take your seats or come inside, and then we'll um, we'll start off with some questions if you have any. So I think what we'll do is just raise your hand, and then I'll run over to you with the microphone. Um, so yeah, let's let's uh, get going with that. Anybody's got a question that they'd like to ask? Thank you for your presentation. But I was wondering whether you've seen the Joanna Lumley's um, documentary on finding the ark. Um, there have been quite a number of such documentaries. A lot of claims have been made about it. Um, I don't know of any yet that I would call completely convincing. One of the problems is that um, if you imagine the uh, enormous tourism industry that would develop if somebody could persuade the media and the world that they'd actually found the remnants of Noah's Ark. And so there's a very strong temptation to fabricate things so it looks like it is. And most of what's happened thus far has been shown to not be uh, a real find. I think you'd be delighted to hear Joanna Lumley and her expose. Hmm. Okay, well I'd be interested to follow that up. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you also for uh, this evening. I wonder whether um, your organisation has a view on tectonic plates and rate of drift and how that shaped the world. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I have just a couple of things that I can share on that. Um, I'm just finding this is not very friendly when it comes to... Uh, moving things, so if you bear with me for a moment, I will try and uh, get this to respond. Um, tectonic plate movements and so on are uh, observable, so that's observ observable science. Um, in fact, we know, ah, here we go. All right, let me see if I can make this go. Okay, so we know today that the Earth's crust uh, consists of huge tectonic plates that grind very slowly together at sort of centimetre per year kinds of rates. Um, and uh, scientists look at those things and, uh, and what they do is um, wind the clock backwards, if you will. So what we measure is, is very slow movements and then if you move them backwards um, it takes millions and millions of years to reposition the continents and so on. But that's a, a principle called uniformitarianism where you look at a rate which is happening today and then wind it backwards on the assumption that nothing has changed and everything proceeds at the same rate. But if you take the Bible's record of history it uh, says in the Bible that uh, at the onset of the flood, it says um, all the springs of the great deep burst forth and the floodgates of the heavens were opened. So this speaks of a catastrophic event and it wasn't just 40 days and 40 nights of torrential rain. What happened first was the springs of the great deep burst forth. So what are the springs of the great deep? Well, geologists who believe the Bible have looked at the geological evidence and tried to construct some models of what might have happened at the onset of the flood. So these tectonic or continental plates um, could have fractured at the onset of the flood and have been moving not at centimetre per year kinds of rates but at, um, you know, in a rapid way, metres per second in what's called catastrophic tectonics, in a runaway process, releasing massive quantities of the Earth's magma 
um, firstly where the, the um, uh, subduction is taking place and also at the other end where it's tearing apart. So you end up with uh, huge volcanic eruptions occurring on a global scale along with the uh, torrential rain. Now you might remember the, um, the picture I showed of the layers and layers of rock punctuated by volcanic eruptions uh, not far from where I live in Sydney. That is sort of consistent with what you might expect in that, in that sort of situation. So if you, let me just come down a bit now to talk about, now we would believe that all of that tectonic movement would have taken place in the year-long flood and it was not the result of, uh, uh, of, of you know, billions of years of process. So what we're seeing today is in fact the, the aftermath, the final slowing down. Um, geologists today put the continents together uh, like a jigsaw puzzle and they say there's probably one big landmass. But you know, it's interesting in Genesis chapter 1, on the third day of creation week, it says that God drew all the waters together into one place and the dry land appeared, which suggests indeed there was one land mass. We don't know its shape. And it's probably that land mass which was fractured and broken and the, the movement then started to, to, uh, to take place around the continent. But all those volcanic eruptions which would have happened would have had the effect um, of, um, of heating the, uh, the oceans. And volcanic eruptions, of course, give rise to a lot of high altitude ash and so on. So the skies would likely have been overcast and grey. There's less light and warmth reaching the land. So you end up with cold land and warm oceans at the subsidence of the flood which leads to a lot of uh, evaporation and then precipitation onto cold land. So you'll have a lot of ice and snow and sleet and all those are in fact the conditions you need for an ice age. Now interestingly, the um, climatologists today try and work out how the multiple ice ages that they believe have occurred would have been triggered. What, what mechanism triggers an ice age? And simply getting cold is not sufficient. You've got to get precipitation. So the warm oceans is exactly what you need, that thermal imbalance. And at a uh, recent conference, they say, although theories abound, no one really knows what causes ice ages. But we do know from the geological record that the ice didn't actually cover the whole of the Earth, like you might be led to believe from some Disney movies, but was likely... Uh, limited where you, you find evidence of glaciation and so on, probably not around the equatorial regions. And, um, but what was really interesting, this is what I'm leading to, is there was a study done by NASA on water levels. And uh, you can find this um, off, a, off the, um, well, it came from Science Alert, but it's NASA material. And it's going to be rather difficult to see. The, the images are not very clear, but... Um, what they did was to map the shape of the land masses as the ocean levels drop. And if you lower the oceans by 100 metres, I think you can see it there a bit better, you can see that extra land that's now appeared. And it turns out if the waters were about 100 metres lower than where they are now, you could basically walk from Tasmania to the Middle East, uh, England was joined to Europe, the Bering Straits uh, are connected. In fact, I think I've got them highlighted here in this next slide. Um, across the Indonesian archipelago, so you could walk from Tasmania to Tierra del Fuego. Um, extraordinary. So as the, um, the waters started to subside, as the Ice Age commenced immediately following the flood, we believe there's only one Ice Age, probably lasted for something like uh, I don't know, five to seven centuries. Um, and then as the thermal equilibrium returned, the ocean levels uh, then started to rise and uh, returned to where they were. So, but what you have is a plausible migratory path for the animals off the ark in the centuries post-flood and also for human beings post the Tower of Babel, which would have been a bit over a century after uh, the arc took place. So by the end of that period, the water levels have risen and you end up breaking those, um, 
those land bridges and you get isolated populations of people and animals and so on. Um, so the tectonic plates uh, you see still moving today and still producing significant geological activity like the uh, devastating earthquake in Turkey and Assyria a month or so back now. Um, so that's real observable science, but I think it fits in very well to the description that we have in the Bible of, uh, of Noah's flood um, and what would have, would have been the ensuing ice age. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, the question was about fracking. Um, not really a... Uh, I mean, I'm no expert in those things, but um, I think there are many, many signs that would indicate that um, we are, I believe, in the last days. I don't believe we are far away from seeing Jesus return. And I say that not because of that so much as other things that we see happening. Uh, for instance, we know that... Um, everything is running down. It's a fundamental principle of science, the second law of thermodynamics. So we find uh, that our DNA, for instance, is accumulating more and more copying mistakes or mutations. So human beings are degrading. We're actually devolving. We're not evolving. We're getting worse and worse. And there's an excellent book up there on the table. It's called Genetic Entropy, which is well worth a read because it it just shows that the Darwinian evolutionary model is uh, completely negated. It, it goes the wrong way. Evolution has us getting better and better, where the observed science has us actually getting worse and worse. So humanity's running downhill. We find... Physically. Physically. Physically running down. Our DNA is getting worse and worse. Why do I believe... Because observations. Oh, what is the cause of mutations? All kinds of causes. Um, things get broken, and so the copying process in our DNA is flawed. So in the, it's like uh, you know you've got three billion letters in your DNA. So when you get cell divisions taking place, the DNA is being copied, and any copying process which involves machinery, which the cells do, is therefore prone to the risk of error. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You can find, uh, like, radiation effects will uh, enhance the rate at which uh, these things will occur. Um, toxins will do it. Uh, all, all manner of things. All manner of things will lead to a, de a degradation in our DNA. So it's an observable phenomenon. It's not, not something. Well, we're, we're not... Um, we're not getting better. <laughs> and we live in a broken, fallen world. That's the point, you see. But the fallenness took place right back when Adam rebelled against God. And it's been a downhill process ever since. But quite apart from that, we look at other things happening in the world today and we are, for the first time, actually capable of annihilating ourselves, which we have not been uh, in previous centuries. So all of that says to me that... Um, I'm not putting dates on it, right? But I believe that it's time for the church to awaken, to stand on the word of God, to declare what we believe with confidence and do so in a way which is winsome, not condemning, so that we can draw as many people as possible into the kingdom, which the Lord says um, is uh, going to be a herald, if you like, of those end times. So good question. Thank you. Any other questions? I don't normally talk about the end of the book. I normally talk about the beginning of the book. No, sorry. Yes, yes, that's true. Uh, this is not technically a... Um, this is prior to the fall. We talk about with the fall came death and sin. That, that's how it's affected mankind. But how would you postulate creation would have gone without 
what we call death. So, for example, I, I, I take down trees or trim trees, whatever you want to call it. Uh, we, we observe that a tree grows, it gets to a, a point where it's mature, and then it naturally dies. That's something we observe today. What would have happened prior to the fall if we define death as the... Do you get my question? Okay. I think one of the things there is to be clear about what the Bible means when it talks about life and death. Remember that, for instance, in the case of plants, uh, we say a plant is dead. But a plant is actually a biological machine that takes carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, turns it into oxygen, draws um, nutrients from the ground and produces sugars and grows, right? Um, but it's not alive in a biblical sense. So we call plants alive and dead, probably better to say they're functional or non-functional. So, and I say that because um, on the sixth day of creation, God gives all the plants for the animals and man to eat. So they are intended to be eaten and digested and processed, and that was the source of, of energy for the animal kingdom. Um, so the Bible talks about, in the Hebrew it says nefesh haya, which it means the breath of life, often translated that way. Um, it's like uh, animals with nostrils, if you like, is another sort of rough generalisation. So Noah had with him two of every kind of animal with nefesh haya. So are insects alive? Well, I think you can make a case that insects are God's little robots that zoom about the biosphere um, pollinating plants and cleaning things up but they're not actually alive but we think of them as alive am i heading towards what you're, you're that's precisely at? what i was thinking yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm just trying to get my head around the bit that you, how you are explaining what's alive and what's not alive. So, are you supposing that life is because there is the spirit of God within? Uh, no, because um, I mean, I suppose I'm talking about sentient life, if you will, self-aware, uh, like animals uh, and so on are self-aware. And so are we, but mankind is unique because God breathed his spirit into us. Mm -hmm. And there are three uh, interesting occurrences where the word bara occurs in the Old Testament, the Hebrew. And it tends to be used, although there's lots of debate about it, in context of creating something out of nothing. The other is asa, which can mean using pre-existing materials to assemble something. So bara occurs three times. Uh, it, occurs, it occurs right at the beginning. It occurs on day five at the creation of sentient life. And it occurs on day six when God breathes his spirit into man. So the sort of picture you get is God, mankind is a three-part <coughs> being, body, soul, spirit. And in that sense, we are unique and made unique in God's image. Animals... Uh, body and soul in the sense of having minds, intelligence uh, and they're sentient, they're self-aware. Uh, there's evidence that insects are not self-aware. Um, there was an interesting experiment done apparently where they presented the abdomen of a dragonfly to its mouth and it proceeded to eat itself um, without any indication of there being pain or stopping. You know, it was quite... Anyway, I don't know if that helps, but if you get hold of... Um, Jonathan Sarfati's book, the Genesis um, account, I think he, he's got a, a section in that discusses that, that issue of uh, what is life in a biblical sense. Hmm. Maybe one more question if anybody's got one. Yeah. Yeah, just a question about um, before the fall into sin, you often hear that 
certain things changed when the fall into sin happened in terms of creation. Um, what do you think about radioactive decay, for example? Um, it's often, obviously, it's a decay process. It's degenerative, you know, um, unstable into stable. Would that have been before, would, would, that, would that have been present before the fall into sin? That's a good question. I actually don't know. But what I can say is God created the universe um, to exist essentially forever. The only reason it's running down now is because of sin. Adam and Eve were not created to die, for instance. The organs in our body all replenish themselves. If you had asked me how old I am, I could ask you, well, which bit do you mean? Okay, my skin is probably seven or eight days old. My hair might be a few years old. Uh, my liver is probably a year old. Uh, my bones are a different age again because the, our cells reproduce and repair all the time. We're designed to, in fact, live forever. But what happens now as a result of the fall is that our organs are able to reproduce and repair a certain number of times and then it runs out of the ability to do that. And so our organs wear out, we get old. It's actually a genetic mechanism and ultimately we can't sustain life and we die. So we weren't designed to die. Just imagine if we were designed to die. Um, presumably you'd get 15 minutes of warning or something. You'd ring up your friends and say goodbye, make sure you've got your will in order and you curl up in the corner and off you go. But <laughs> it's not like that, is it? So something has changed before the fall to after. So before the fall, the second law of thermodynamics must have been operating because they were eating plants. They were digesting them. They could walk, and walking involves friction. That involves loss of energy. So the second law of thermodynamics was operating, but something else was also operating. So whilst disorder was increasing, God was miraculously doing something to sustain his creation so that the disorder was reduced commensurately. Now, there's a fascinating little hint of that when the children of Israel are on the Exodus. And we read that for 40 years, their clothes and their shoes did not wear out. So that makes you think, ah, so there's something that was going on then that maybe God reactivated miraculously for his people on that occasion. So what it was that was reducing entropy is part of what I imagine God withdrew at the time of the fall. It says thorns and thistles sprang up. Now, I don't believe God was vindictive and said, oh, you naughty people and smack. But in the withdrawal of his sustaining power, then things began to malfunction. So a thorn is actually just a malformed leaf, which is just twisted tightly on itself and has never opened, um, for instance. So we don't know what it was that was going on before the fall. So to your question about radioactive decay, um, perhaps it was happening. Uh, perhaps whatever was causing that was also uh, being balanced out and reversing. I really have got no idea. But a good question. All right, I think that's about it for tonight. folks for your attention and uh, as you're going make sure that you are equipped to give an answer to everyone who asks you for the reason and that's why our ministry exists so thank you Thanks, Mark. That was uh, really good. I, I really appreciate you coming out, and we, um, yeah, I hope everybody that was here would have been um, strengthened, and at least uh, um, would now th their interest would be piqued to go and do a bit more investigation and, and read on the creation.com website, and uh, have signed up for some of the material and bought, bought some of the books. So we're just passing the bag around. You don't feel obligated, but if you want to, then please just. Um, drop something in the bag to support the ministry and uh, we really appreciate that thank you very much and um, that's about it I will just wait for the bag to go around and then I'll close for us in, in prayer
maybe one other comment while we're waiting. We did live stream this, so it should be on YouTube. So even if you want to revisit this again over the next few days or so, or share with your friends or whatever, please feel free to do that. And, and then we'll, um, yeah, hopefully it'll spread even more and uh, you guys will be, well, we'll all be blessed by that. Thanks, thank you, Ms. Rose. Okay, thank you for that. I'll, uh, I'll close for us in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening that we were able to spend together as, as uh, Christians and that we were um, strengthened by all of this uh, evidence that was presented to us, Lord, that um, your word is truth and that your creation testifies uh, to this as well and that we can speak to those that are unbelieving with confidence knowing that uh, we have your truth on our side and that as long as we stand with you that we are on the side of truth, and then ultimately we do not have to fear anything. We ask that you would help us to think, think through these things and also uh, do the work of investigating uh, these things a little bit further so we can be better informed about your creation. And along with this, obviously, to study your word and um, see how wonderfully you've created all of this world for us to live in. We ask that you would bless this ministry as well, Creation Ministries, and, and Dr. Harwood as well for... Um, the work that they do, bless them on their path forward as well for Dr. Howard where he travels back uh, with his wife to their home. Uh, keep them safe and uh, let them enjoy this country and, and another part of your creation as well. We ask that you always also keep um, all of us safe this evening as we travel back to our homes and our families. Um, and we ask all of this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.